Today on the Emmanuel Pulpit. When taking the life of an unborn bald eagle carries a stiffer penalty than taking the life of an unborn human being, we cannot expect an immature teenager to value human life. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. I'll always remember when I first heard that word. It was a beautiful spring afternoon, a Tuesday in fact. I was kind of wrung out from preparations and the presentations of the 1999 Blackshear Passion Play. And so I had taken that Tuesday afternoon off to do what men do when we have the day off, and that is we do what our wives told us to do. I was painting our living room with its two-story high vaulted walls and ceilings. I was up on some scaffolding. The TV was turned on when the reporter came on and said that word. Now, I never heard that word before, but I haven't been able to forget it since. You see, the word was a name, and the name was a place, a small place, an otherwise insignificant place, so small it's actually not even a city, it's an unincorporated community, much like Hacklebarney might be. But what I heard that day about that word was unlike anything I had ever heard before. I climbed off the scaffolding to see if the video would match the audio, and I couldn't believe my ears, and I couldn't believe my eyes. That word was Columbine. Unfortunately, since that time, there have been other words, other names, other places, other tragedies. Sandy Hook, Pearl, Mississippi, Fort Hood, Virginia Tech, Las Vegas, and this week, Parkland, Florida. And this list does not even include the other types of tragedies that our nation faces on a seemingly daily basis. Police shootings in places like New York and Dallas. The shooting of Trayvon Martin in Sanford, Florida. Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Freddie Gray in Baltimore, Maryland. And if the inclusion of those last names bothers you, stand by. (laughs) How are we as the people of God to respond when breaking news breaks our heart? Brother Job, thousands of years ago, gives us a great example If you're able and willing, I'll ask you to stand to your feet for the public reading of God's Word. You know the context, the sad story in the life of Brother Job. The reporters come. In his case, they are servants. And they come with breaking news. The cattle have been taken. Breaking news, the sheep have been taken. Breaking news, the servants have been killed. Breaking news, no doubt the worst of them all, all of your children are dead. And look at how this ancient man of God responded. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Father, would you bless the reading of your word And strengthen this assembly of your people with it. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord. Amen. Be seated, please. If you watch much cable news, if you are a news junkie, as is your pastor, then you probably agree with me that the breaking news video clip is vastly overused by most television networks. It seems like every ten minutes there's breaking news of one sort or another. And I just want to say at some point, if everything is breaking news, then nothing is really breaking news. But the reality is, there are days when there truly is breaking news. Some of it is national. Some of it is personal. And whether the breaking news is private or personal, national or public, life has a way of bringing painful, unexpected news into our lives and Job gives us a little idea of how to respond. Now in the interest of time tonight I'm just going to tie myself to my notes and I want to show you three ways we ought to respond when breaking news breaks our heart. 
First of all, take time and lament the loss. Now we don't do a very good job of lamenting as believers. That word just means to grieve, to mourn, to weep, to feel deep, intense sorrow. Maybe we're not good at it because we think we're supposed to have all the answers. We're the spiritual expert in the workplace. We're the theological scholar maybe on the ball team. And people who don't know anything about God or the Bible will frequently turn to a known professing Christian. And so I believe we're not very good at lamenting loss. But I remind you tonight that throughout the Psalms, there are Psalms of lament. Indeed, there's a book of your Bible called the book of Lamentations based on the word lament. It is penned under divine inspiration by one known as the weeping prophet, Brother Jeremiah. In the Holy Land, there is today still a wailing wall where many of God's chosen people go and they weep and lament what could have been and should have been spiritually. Job gives us an example, though we don't lament by ripping our clothing or shaving our head or sitting in sackcloth and ashes. He gives us an example of how a blameless, upright, walking, lockstep with God, how that kind of person experiencing grief can still be submissive to God and lament loss. Now, as we take time and lament the loss when breaking news comes, I believe that Job would give us three simple ways we ought to do that. First, with sympathetic hearts. With sympathetic hearts. When tragedy strikes at home in our own community, it's easy for us to know how to feel. When there's an untimely death of an infant or a teenager in our own community, we seem to We seem to be able to wrap our minds around the fact that we're supposed to grieve and lament and weep. But let's be honest, when tragedy strikes far away, it's easy to be distant and cold. Have you been guilty as your pastor has? There's breaking news. Uh, An earthquake has killed several dozen people. And then you find out it's in some unknown place on the other side of the world. And there's a sense in which you say, oh. (laughs) But we are called by our God to grieve when others grieve. And to bear their burdens. Perhaps this is why I remember Columbine so well. Because as the gravity of that tragedy began to press on my heart. I prayed a prayer that it's the only time I've ever prayed it. We did not have children at the time. But I, for some reason I prayed that God would place on my soul. The burden that some of those parents were facing. Now, I do not propose that what I felt in that moment was exactly what a parent experiences having lost their child in such a tragic way. But I will say this, if it was but a taste of it, I don't want any more. This weekend, people in South Florida began burying their teenage children. Sons and daughters who were planning graduation... Sons and daughters whose biggest problem at lunch on Wednesday was acne and dead cell phone batteries. Sons and daughters who were the light of their father's eye and the joy of their mama's heart. This morning when I woke up and if you were here I had a somewhat uncomfortable text and topic laid out before me as your pastor. But I could not experience a lot of discomfort over that because I woke up thinking about the three men for whom we prayed earlier. A moment ago when I mentioned the names of some well-known people who died rightly or wrongly at the hands of the police. Did it bother you when I lumped in their names with the names of innocent school children? Shot as they responded to a fake fire drill? You see, here's my point, whether we're talking about a ninth grader shot by a gunman at a school in Florida or somebody who should have probably already been in prison confronting the police with a gun of their own and being shot in the process. Whenever someone is killed, there is a mother who has lost a child. And in most of those cases, there's a father grieving the loss of a child. 
There are now likely children growing up without a parent, a husband now without a wife, a wife without a husband. The reality is, as a guilty transgressor of this principle myself, I want to charge us tonight, before we get on our high horse or our social media about the plight of black-on-black crime, we need to stop for just a moment and grieve with the loss of a life and the hurt of a family. To lament the loss with sympathetic hearts, but also, watch this now, with silent mouths. A pastor friend of mine recently went through a very difficult time and I know of another pastor who'd gone through the same thing so I called that pastor and I said you went through what my buddy is going through about 20 years ago what's he going through and how can I respond to him what does he need right now and the older pastor said well he he doesn't need you to preach at him He really just needs you to be there. In the case of Brother Job, when his friends showed up, all they did for seven days and seven nights was stare at him. Kind of awkward, isn't it? But frankly, it got worse when they opened their mouths. (laughs) His wife had already blurted something out by the time All the tragedy really set in. Why don't you just curse God and die? Now, now, let's just time out. We can be really hard on Sister Job, but should we remind ourselves tonight? Those were her kids, too. She had experienced a loss. Sometimes the best thing to say is nothing. In this social media, ready access world where with the flip of your phone out of your pocket and the, and the flurry of thumbs, you can be blurting out your opinion on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or in a group text message. I've come tonight to remind myself and each of us, we don't have to speak to every issue that comes along. This past Friday, I was watching the news and there was a woman down in Parkland, Florida, whose 15-year-old daughter was tragically killed. And they were showing a video of an interview that she had done the day before. And they were having to bleep out all of her curse words as she was cursing the president as if he's personally responsible. And I, I have to confess to you, though I did not use the language she used, I found myself yelling at her. And then it occurred to me, hey, the woman lost her 15-year-old daughter day before yesterday. Maybe you ought to hush and give her a pass. We ought to lament the loss with sympathetic hearts, with silent mouths, and with sensitive spirits. One of the problems that Job's friends had when they came is they opened up their mouth with no sense of discernment about what really was on the heart of God at all. Solomon speaks of the beauty of a word spoken in due season, that is, spoken at the right time. And in the wisdom of God that Solomon gives us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, he begins to talk to us about how there is a time appointed for everything. There's a time for every event under heaven, and he begins to give the list. A time to give birth, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill, a time to heal, to tear down, to build up, to weep, to laugh, to mourn, to dance, a time to throw stones, a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, a time to shun embracing, a time to search, a time to give up that which is lost, a time to keep, a time to throw away, a time to tear apart, a time to sew together, a time to be silent, and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What I'm saying tonight is when the bad news breaks your heart, maybe that's not the best time for us to feel like we've got to have the answer. When the bad news that breaks your heart and the heart of someone you love is about a rebellious teenager, maybe that's not the best time to lecture them about the consequences of their bad parenting. 
When the bad news is about cancer, maybe that's not the best time to lecture them about the danger of cigarette smoking or to talk to them about the glorious beauty of heaven. When a criminal is shot, rightly or wrongly, maybe that's not the best time to talk about the derelict behavior of the deceased. When the breaking news that breaks your heart is about someone's adultery, maybe that's not the best time to console the innocent spouse with Romans 8.28. All things will work together for the good. Remember, this is the day the Lord has made. Oh, hush. Take time and lament the loss. Number two, we're talking about how we respond when breaking news breaks our heart. Don't just take time and lament the loss. Take thought and consider the cause. What started all this? In Job's case, it was actually the sovereignty of God. In the case of tragedies in our lives, we often do not know the exact ultimate cause. Now, when tragedy strikes our nation, you'll find self-appointed experts and political pundits will fill up your television screen, all of them talking about how they know what the cause is. From the New York Times to your Facebook feed, everybody's got an opinion on what causes school shootings. Violent video games, mental illness, drugs, gun laws... Tonight, I think we need to take just a moment or two in God's Word and try to see if we can consider what is the cause of this kind of chaos in our world. The first cause is sinful depravity. There is an ultimate underlying cause behind all heartbreaking news, behind every act of violence, behind every deed of sin, and it is the problem of our depraved sin nature. Depravity has infected and affected every person who has ever been born. That's why Paul said in Romans 3.23 that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own wicked way. Sinful depravity is why you don't have to teach your children to lie. You have to teach them to tell the truth. It's why you don't have to teach your kids to be selfish or stingy or self-centered. You have to teach them to be considerate of others because every person that has ever been born, except for Christ himself, has been born with the stain and the stamp of Adam's sin. I'll tell you the ultimate reason that a 19-year-old will take a semi-automatic rifle onto a school campus and kill his classmates is because he's absolutely full of the devil and his heart is depraved before God. As has often been said, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Sinful depravity begins in the heart, but it does not stay in the heart. It works its way out of the body through the hands. That's why we touch what we ought not touch, and we take what we ought not take. We do what we ought not do. Depravity comes out of the hands. Depravity comes out of the mouth. That's why we lie and gossip and tell, bear and hate and slander and curse and swear and bully and name call and involve ourselves in filthy talk and coarse jesting. It's because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth is speaking. Sinful depravity doesn't have to be taught. Children do it naturally. In fact, all of God's children of all ages do it naturally. Ephesians 2, 3, describing our pre-regenerate state, says we were by nature children of wrath. Jesus said in Mark 7, 21, speaking of this issue of depravity, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, Murders and adulteries. Now the weapon of choice this week may have been a semi-automatic weapon, but the root cause is a depraved heart. Now listen, friend, legislation may or may not be well advised in these cases, but legislation in and of itself will not fix the problem. 
You collect every gun that you could imagine and if a depraved man wants to kill somebody, he'll strangle them with his bare hands. If he needs to, he will bombard them with spitballs until they die. Sinful depravity. There's another cause and I'm just going to drill down into it for just a moment. And that is societal desensitization. Our society has been calloused to the precious precious, inestimable value of human life. Last November, just a few months ago, following the tragic shootings at the country music concert out in Las Vegas, there was an article that appeared in the New York Times. The article quoted a British journalist, and here's what Dan Hodges, a British journalist, said. He said, in retrospect, Sandy Hook, that's the that's the shooting that occurred at, a, at an elementary school and a lot of preschoolers were killed. He says that looking back in retrospect, Sandy Hook marked the end of the U.S. gun control debate. Once America decided killing children was bearable, it was over. I actually agree with him 100%, but not in the way in which he means. Now, I don't have time to go fully into this logical argument, but I want to say this as plainly as I can say it. It makes no sense at all to tell teenagers that their mothers could have killed them in their womb if mama had only wanted to, and then expect that same teenager to turn around and respect the value of the lives of their classmates. It makes no sense... To spend decade after decade after decade in the public school system. I thank God for public school teachers. But it makes no sense to send children decade after decade through the public classrooms of this country. To tell them that they evolved from pond scum. That there is no creator. That they are here just by random evolutionary processes. And the kind intention of their parents. And then expect that they're going to act like their classmates bear the image of God and that they themselves will one day stand before God and give an account for their life. When taking the life of an unborn bald eagle carries a stiffer penalty than taking the life of an unborn human being, we cannot expect an immature teenager to value human life. Nine days ago, I'm talking about how our country and our culture has been desensitized. Nine days ago, the GOP-controlled Congress failed once again to defund Planned Parenthood. Now you listen to your pastor tonight. The defunding of Planned Parenthood, which I pray for regularly, has revealed itself to be little more than a cheap political get-out-the-vote trick that is perpetrated by lily-livered Republican candidates. They've got the majority. They've got the White House. They could do that if they wanted to. They just flat don't want to do it. Amen. On January the 29th, just a couple of weeks before this horrific tragedy, your United States Senate failed to approve legislation that would ban abortions after 20 weeks. Now to support the killing of unborn children while expecting born children to respect one another's lives is lunacy at best. Now you don't have enough sense to come in out of the rain. Sinful depravity. Societal desensitization. And then there's the cause of spiritual deception. Spiritual deception. Our adversary, the devil, is described as a deceiver. When he first appears on the pages of your Bible in Genesis chapter 3, he is subtle, he's crafty, he's scheming, he is deceptive, and he has just flat deceived this nation. Last week, because of news services to which I subscribe, email updates, my email inbox was filled up with various reports of two different incidents in this country. Two different incidents. One was obviously from Parkland, Florida. The other was from McKinney, Texas. A suburb of Dallas, Texas. 
There the school board had voted to breach its contract with the Prestonwood Baptist Church, one of the largest churches in America, certainly one of the largest in the Dallas-Fort Worth metroplex. They decided to breach the contract and pay penalties for the breach of that contract, moving their graduation services for their many, many high schools to a, to a small, old, dirty, nasty civic arena rather than to have it in the sanctuary of one of the nicest churches in the country because Preston would thankfully refuse to cover up the cross. I thank God for Pastor Jack Graham. So I don't care how much money you pay to rent our facility. We're not covering up the cross for anybody. I'm talking about satanic spiritual deception. Did you know that when the Supreme Court of the United States outlawed the posting of the Ten Commandments, you can read the case yourself. This was their logic. We cannot allow the school systems to post the Ten Commandments because if they are posted, school children might read them. If they read them, they might begin to meditate upon them. If they begin to meditate upon them, they might be led to respect them. And that might lead to them obeying them. Those aren't my verbs. Those are verbs taken from the court case from your United States Supreme Court. Do you think there are any parents? I'm not trying to politicize. God knows I'm not trying to politicize. I'm trying to spiritualize what happened in Parkland, Florida just this past week. But don't you think there are some parents that wish that this 19-year-old gunman had read the Ten Commandments and meditated upon it and respected it and obeyed the Word of God that said, Thou shalt not kill? After one of our nation's tragic school shootings, a high school student out in Arizona wrote a new prayer. Now I sit me down in school where praying is against the rule, for this great nation under God finds mention of him very odd. If scripture now the class recites, it violates the Bill of Rights, and any time my head I bow becomes a federal matter now. Our hair can be purple, orange, or green. That's no offense. It's a freedom scene. The law is specific. The law is precise. Prayers spoken aloud are a serious vice. For praying in a public hall might offend someone with no faith at all. In silence alone we must meditate. God's name is prohibited by the state. We're allowed to cuss and dress like freaks and pierce our noses, tongues, and cheeks. They've outlawed guns, but first... The Bible, to quote that book, will make you liable. We can elect a pregnant senior queen and the unwed daddy as our senior king. It's inappropriate to teach right from wrong. We're taught that such judgments do not belong. We can come and get free birth control, study witchcraft, vampires, and totem poles, but the Ten Commandments are not allowed. No word of God must reach this crowd. It's scary here, I must confess, where chaos reigns, this school's a mess. So, Lord, this silent plea I make, should I be shot? My soul, please, take. Spiritual deception. Let me make it as plain as I know how. Don't ever say God's been kicked out of school. God hasn't been kicked out of school. God's everywhere. But God has been told, we don't want you in charge. Listen very carefully. And the worst thing that God could ever do for a person, a family, a school, a community, a state, or a nation... The worst thing God could ever do is say, all right, you don't want me in control? You can have it. And as it was in the days before the judges, when every man does what is right in his own eyes, we should not be at all surprised that what some people see as right is very, very wrong. So what should we do? We should take time and lament the loss. We should take thought and consider the cause. And thirdly and very quickly, take truth and share the solution. 
You see, we don't want to just be the kind of people who curse the darkness. We want to be people who shine the light. So let me give you three light bulbs to shine tonight, and I'm going to hit these in the next five minutes or so. First of all, we need to share the solution biblically, not culturally. When we speak of the solution, we should speak of that which is consistent with the Word of God, not our own personal preferences, our upbringing, our rearing, or our culture. Listen, friend. While we should not be afraid of legitimate legislation, the answer is not going to be found in the halls of Congress, but in the pages of the Bible. You see, it's in the Bible that we learn about the problem of sin. It's in the Bible that we learn the only solution is a blood-stained, sin-killing cross where God crucified His own Son under His divine and holy wrath against sin. We should respond biblically. Could I, could I say it more plainly tonight? Don't respond like a redneck. Respond like a Christian. Now it would be good if you could respond like a Christian redneck. Come on somebody. Don't respond like a Georgian. Respond like a Christian. Don't respond like a southerner. Respond like a Christian. Don't respond like a card-carrying member of the NRA. Respond like a Bible-carrying child of the Most High God. Let others in the nation argue and talk about guns. We've got an opportunity to talk about our God. So share the solution biblically, not culturally. Note also, share the solution logically, not politically. Now, you'll be glad to know I'm just about out of time, so I'm going to save us some time and say this. Quit saying stupid stuff. Check the facts before you post something on social media. Write this down, Snopes.com. Donald Trump is not the answer. Oprah is not the problem. The problem is sin and the answer is Jesus. Respond logically. Don't say they'll take my guns when they pry them from my cold dead hands. Oh, hush. <laughs> Lastly, share the solution evangelistically, not fearfully. Don't wring your hands in fear. Who wants to follow somebody who's scared to death every time trouble comes to the world? Use the reality of sin and the reality of death to talk about Jesus. This has been my prayer for the pastors that, whose names I mentioned earlier in this service. God, for them and for other brother pastors in that area, the door is wide open to talk about the gospel. I want to say a special word to our students that are here tonight and others who may be listening later by our podcast. If your classmates comment about being afraid or if they ask you, are you afraid? Or do you ever think anything like that could happen here? They may not have intended it, but do you know what they just did? They just said, would you please open your mouth and open your Bible and tell me about Jesus so that I can know how I can be prepared not only to live victoriously in this life, but eternally in the life to come. At the end of Job's heartbreaking, fast-breaking news, he says about in the middle of the book in Job 19, 25, As for me, I know that my Redeemer liveth. You say, Brother Mike, do you have all the answers for legislation we might need to pass in this country? Or, honestly, more personally, do you want to talk about why you think no legislation is going to fix it because it's not a gun issue, it's a heart issue. There's a lot about this stuff that I don't know, but I want to agree with Brother Job. There's, there's something I do know. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and on the last day he will take his stand upon the earth. So tonight I want to encourage you. Take time and lament the loss. Whether it's this tragedy or personal tragedy in your own life, it's okay sometimes to just sit down and cry. And grieve. Take thought and consider the cause. The root cause is the problem of the sin of man's heart. Then take truth and share the solution. The solution was most succinctly stated by the late 
Andre Crouch, a great gospel singer who just so beautifully and simply said, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there's no other. Jesus is the way. May I ask you a question tonight? All the music tonight was about the cross. All the music tonight was about the precious Lord Jesus. Do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? I would not wish the kind of tragic death that visited Parkland, Florida on my worst critic. But the Bible teaches it is appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. I sincerely pray that you never go through the doorway of death because of a gunman's bullet. But if the Lord tarries in his return, the day is going to come. They will be planning your funeral. The only thing that's going to matter in that moment is not whether or not your life was filled with good news or heartbreaking news, but do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Mike Stone, Senior Pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Blackshear, Georgia. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, Pastor Mike is committed to walking you verse by verse through books of the Bible. We pray this message has been an encouragement to you as you seek to learn and live the Word of God. Free audio downloads of this message, as well as general contact information, are available through our website at ebchurch.net. Thanks for joining us for today's message from the Emmanuel Pulpit.